Chapter 1 You know what's awesome? Social studies. Let's go, guys. We don't want to keep Mrs. Godfrey waiting. Yep, you heard me. Social studies is officially the highlight of my day. I like it better than English and science and math. I even like it better than art, which is really saying something. Since I happen to be Nate Wright, artistic genius. You're probably thinking, wait a minute. Hasn't social studies always been a king-size zit on the forehead of life? Answer, duh. So how come it suddenly jumped to the top of my hot list? Well, it's not because I've magically morphed into a butt-kissing toady like Gina. Even though you didn't tell us to, I read chapter six and answered all the review questions. Here, have some homemade fudge. I haven't become a factoid freak like Francis either. Did you know that during his presidency, Franklin Pierce was arrested for running over a woman with his horse? Wow! Nobody's listening, man. And it's not like the teaching's gotten any better. Who cares if I said there wouldn't be a test today? I changed my mind! So, what's different? Simple answer. The seating chart. Since dinosaurs roamed the Earth, Gina sat behind me in social studies. I can't prove this, but I'm pretty sure it's Mrs. Godfrey's secret plan for keeping tabs on yours truly. Agent G4 to Mama Bear. Subject is drawing in his textbook. Over. Good work, G4. Over and out. It's also given me a nervous twitch, thanks to Gina's psychotic auto-response every time Mrs. Godfrey asks a question. Ooh! But... I digress. The point is, Gina's a pain in my backside. So when old Dragon Breath decided it was time to shake up the seating arrangements last week, I was totally into it. It couldn't get any worse, right? Way right. She moved Gina to the smelliest spot in the room. Welcome to Death Valley, Needle Nose. She's stuck between Mark Cheswick, who farts all the time, and Seth Q-tip Quincy with his nasty pits. Urk! And me? I get to sit in front of Ruby Dinsmore. I don't know her very well yet, but she seems really nice. She's cute, too. And, best of all, she doesn't go around sucking up to teachers and sticking a report card in your face like Princess Know-It-All. Gina out, Ruby in. Talk about an upgrade! That's why social studies rocks lately. Hi, Nate. Hi, Ruby. Hey, did you finish the homework? I got stuck on number 10. Yeah, I did too, I say, flipping open my notebook. Let me find it and I'll... I'll... Um... Huh. It's gotta be here somewhere. I'm a little disorganized. <laughs> What's that? This? Oh, just a comic book I made, I tell her. Really? Can I read it? Ruby asks. I hesitate. It's not... I mean, I haven't quite finished it yet, so that's okay. I don't mind that it isn't done. Er, but it is done. I was just trying to avoid showing it to her because... Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Ultranate, super sixth grader, starring in... Power Outage! What's wrong with me? Why am I so weak? One day at PS38, in Mrs. Godzilla's classroom... Eureka! I found a way to destroy my arch-nemesis, Ultranate! But I'll need help to put my evil plan into action. Flunky, come here. You bellowed, my beloved mentor? Yes, here's what I want you to do. Psst, 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 psst. Mrs. Godzilla, you're a genius. Later, in the art studio. Oh, Nate, you're so talented. Just doing what I do best. Help! Uh-oh, sounds like someone's in trouble in the hallway. This is a job for 
Ultra Nate! Rip! Flunky, where's the emergency? Right here! Bzzzt! What? What happened? I feel weak as a kitten. You are! Thanks to Mrs. Godzilla's invention, the Transferizer. It took away your ultra powers. And now, when I press this button, click, it transfers your powers to her. Yes! Look at me. I'm ultra strong, ultra coordinated. I can even fly. I'm taking over this school, and no one can stop me. And so, all the students were captured and put in chains. I've chased off all the good teachers. Now I can run things my way. Can't you do something, Alternate? Maybe I can. If Mrs. Godzilla now has my powers, she might also have my weaknesses. But what weaknesses do you have? Just one. Egg salad. I must reach that container in the lunch line. With his arms chained behind his back, Ultra Nate carefully balances the egg salad on his head and launches himself at Mrs. Godzilla. Take that, you fiend! Splot! Go! Oh, no! Get it off me! I'll take that transferizer flunky, kick, and turn myself back into Ultra Nate Zap! Leave this school forever, Mrs. Godzilla, and take your sidekick with you. Her reign of terror is over. Alternate, you're wonderful. What? End. Ruby giggles as she hands back my comic book. I like it, she whispers. And I think I recognize some of these characters. Okay. But which characters? See, that's why I sort of didn't want her to read it. She's the one kissing me in the last panel. It's not supposed to be realistic or anything. It's just a comic. But I wouldn't want her to think, you know, that I'm sitting around waiting for her to put a lip lock on me, because I'm not. I could have drawn anybody in that last panel. The fact that I drew her is totally, um... What's the word? Ahem. Ah! Mrs. Godfrey looms over me, nostrils flaring. How does she do it? The woman's the size of a woolly mammoth on an all-lard diet, but I never hear her coming. She just appears. What have you got there? She demands, peering suspiciously at my comic book. Quick observation, this isn't going to end well. N -n nothing I stammer, trying to stuff it back into my binder. Just a project for another class. A class, you say? Swip! Hmm? I wasn't aware the school offered a class in insulting people. Insulting? Excuse me, I just wrote a six-page masterpiece starring her. You'd think she'd be flattered, but no. She's reaching for her little pink pad. Detention, here I come. Go ahead and stare, everybody. I know you want to. Francis. Mother again. Gina. Serves him right. Dee Dee. This is so dramatic. Teddy. Dude. Artur. Jenny, you are my fuzzy mushroom. Jenny. Aw, love. Randy. What a loser. Chad. Was that my stomach? With one beefy hand, Mrs. Godfrey slams a detention slip down on my desk. Take this to Mrs. Sir Wiki after school, she growls. Great. It'll be so much fun hanging out with Mrs. Sir Wiki again. I haven't seen her since... When was it? Oh, yeah. Yesterday. I managed to make it through the rest of my classes without any major disasters. There's a close call in art involving a tube of sky blue paint, a swivel chair, and Mr. Rose's pants. Plus, science is a nightmare because my partner for the lab report is Kim Cressley. When you're done with that, 
I'm ready to cuddle. But finally, the bell rings. School's over. For most people. I've still got an hour to go, thanks to Mrs. Godfrey's total lack of a sense of humor. I trudge into the detention room, praying that Mrs. Sir Wiki's not in one of her complaining moods. The other day, she yacked for 45 minutes about her varicose veins, whatever those are. And then... Hey, what are you doing here? Chapter 2 Gina, of all people, is standing next to Mrs. Sir Wiki's desk. She gives me one of her I'm-better-than-you-are smirks. Take a guess. Well, let's see. Queen Perfectia has only gotten one detention in her life for going ballistic in the library. Long story. P.S. 38 Trivia. The only person ever to send Gina to detention is the librarian, Mrs. Hickson. Our hero. So I doubt she's in any kind of trouble, and sucking up to the detention lady won't score her any precious brownie points. Frankly, I have no clue why she's here. I've got better things to do than to try reading your mind, Gina. I snarl. She nods. That's probably just as well, since my mind is so far above your reading level. <laughs> Your mind's too small for me to read, I snap. That's enough, you two, Mrs. Sir Wiki says. Nate, give me your detention slip. <sighs> Reason for detention. Drawing an inappropriate cartoon in class. Correction, I did not draw it in class. I just happened to have it with me in class. If Mrs. Godfrey's going to stick me in solitary, she should at least get her facts straight. <sighs> Nate, I suggest you take a seat and spend the next hour thinking about what you've done. Right. That's what she always says. I guess she's hoping something like this will happen. Put your head on your desk and no talking. What a sensible suggestion. I'll consider the consequences of my actions. After several minutes of introspection... That cartoon I drew was so mean. How could I have been so cruel? I must apologize to Mrs. Godfrey immediately. Run. Run like the wind. But instead of Mrs. Godfrey, there's a random sub. Where's Mrs. Godfrey? She was so devastated by your cartoon, she had to be hospitalized. Shame cam close up. Oh, no! Soon, at the hospital. Her heart is broken. She's on life support. What have I done? Mrs. Godfrey, can you ever forgive me? I promise to never draw mean cartoons again. Look, she's waking up. Even in a coma, I heard what you said. Did you mean it? I meant every word. I've seen the error of my ways. And it's all because you sent me to detention, you caring person, you. Give me a hug. Gross. Ooh, let's stop there. Even drawing myself hugging it out with old butterbutt would be enough to make me lose my lunch. Anyway... See what I'm getting at about detention. Adults think it teaches kids all these magical life lessons, but it just doesn't work that way. If you ask me, it doesn't work at all. Now, where were we? You were telling me how you first became a detention monitor. Ah, yes, that's quite a story. It happened like this. Blah, 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 And away she goes. For someone who's always telling the rest of us not to talk, Mrs. Sirwicky sure can flap her gums. She acts nonstop until my ears practically start bleeding. Then, thanks, Mrs. Sirwicky. The readers will enjoy this. Readers? I repeat after Gina slithers out of the room. What's she talking about? 
Mrs. Sir Wicky beams. Gina is writing a profile of me for the next edition of the Weekly Bugle. The Weekly Bugle? <laughs> er, the Weekly Bugle! <laughs> That's great! Whoops. Didn't mean to sound like I was dissing the Bugle there. But hey, the Bugle deserves to be dissed. I'll tell you why in a sec. Right now, I've got more important things to take care of. Mrs. Sirwicky, my time is up. Hmm, so it is. All right, Nate, you may go. Okay, see you soon. Yes, probably very soon. Ouch, was that really necessary? I'll admit I get my share of detentions, but it's not like it happens every single day. It's more like two times a week. Or three. Or, um, twelve. Never mind. Let's get back to the Weekly Bugle. That's the school newspaper, and it's bad. Not funny bad, like that book Ms. Clark made us read about the girl raised by dolphins who grew up to become a marine biologist. Just plain old bad bad. The Weekly Bugle has issues. Issue number one... It's boring. We all know that middle schools aren't the most exciting places on Earth. But is that any excuse for headlines like these? No changes planned to lunch menu. Toilet in boys' bathroom still broken. Mr. Galvin thinking of switching from belt to suspenders. Computer lab to get new wastebasket. Bottle drive will begin soon. Math team wins third place in tri-school meet. Student council postpones meeting again. Student survey. What's your favorite color? Yawn. Note to the Weekly Bugle staff. Headlines are supposed to grab you, not put you in a coma. If I were in charge, here's what those same headlines would look like. Lunch stinks. Students' lives at risk. Tidal wave of raw sewage. Kids to school. Stop. Stalling. Mr. Galvin enters. Falling pants zone. Sanity questioned. Garbage piling up in computer lab. Vermin on rampage. Bottle drive. Nobody cares. It doesn't add up. Math nerds finish last. Student council earns reputation as do-nothing losers. Exclusive. Why does Bugle keep running lame student surveys? <laughs> Issue number two. It doesn't have any comics or a horoscope, a crossword puzzle, or one of those columns where people write in for advice about how to spice up their putrid marriages. The only attempt to add anything entertaining to the Bugle was last month when Maura Flaherty put this in. Riddle time! By Mora. What goes up when rain comes down? An umbrella! Uh, nice try, Mora. Your raindrops look like an invasion of mutant onions. Plus, you're not funny. Want to see how to crack people up? Watch how a real cartoonist does it. The Wacky Adventures of Dr. Cesspool by Nate Wright. Mrs. Philby, your operation went perfectly. That's wonderful. What a relief. I was so anxious about this nose job. Uh, nose job? Is something wrong, Doctor? Uh, it turned out you didn't need a nose job after all. Really? Why not? Well, it's sort of a good news, bad news thing. By the way, the Bugle used to include my comics. Then a few whiners complained that Dr. Cesspool performing a tonsillectomy with a chainsaw was too violent. That was the end of my newspaper career. Issue number three. The name makes no sense. Here's how Chad put it the other day. Why do they call it the Weekly Bugle when it only comes out once a month? Exactly. It's so dopey. Maybe they should change the spelling and start calling it the W-E-A-K-L-Y Bugle. All I know is 
The school paper needs a makeover. There you are. How is detention? I roll my eyes. Oh, it was fantastic. I had so much fun eating bonbons and soaking in the hot tub. <laughs> Imagine Mrs. Sirwicky in a hot tub, Francis chuckles. Teddy winces. Do I have to? What are you guys still doing here? I ask. We were out on the soccer field, tossing the frisbee around. Yep, getting ready for the mud bowl. The mud bowl's a long way off, I point out. It's never too early to start training, Teddy answers. Especially with Francis on our team. <laughs> yeah, I... Hey! Teddy, I'm going along. Pass it. Hold on. We shouldn't throw a frisbee inside the building, Francis clucks nervously. Oh, brother, it can be such a drip. Stop worrying, I insist. Nobody'll see us. Everyone's gone home. With a flick of his wrist, Teddy floats the frisbee down the corridor. I go charging after it. Zow! I'm at turbo speed, a few feet away from making a highlight reel top ten plays of the century grab when a door swings open right in front of me. In an instant, two things are clear. First, I was wrong when I said everyone's gone home. And second, I can't stop. Slam! What are you doing, you little turd? My vision's a little blurry right now. High-speed collisions have that effect on me. But I recognize that voice. It's Randy Betancourt, winner of PS 38's Most Likely to Mop the Floor with Someone Else's Face Award. He grabs a fistful of my shirt and yanks me to my feet. Say your prayers, dweeb! Wow, if I live through this, today's going straight to the top of my worst days ever list. Not only is Randy about to break me in half, or another even smaller fraction, he's going to do it in front of Ruby. Chapter 3 All of a sudden, something weird happens. Randy goes from meathead to marshmallow. R Ruby, hi. Cough, uh, how are you? I'm okay, Ruby answers, looking a little puzzled. What are you guys doing? Well, uh, ooh, uh, so, you know, <laughs> just messing around. <laughs> messing around is one way of putting it. Here's another. He's trying to kill me. Anyway, um, I should probably take off. Randy stutters. Then, and don't say you predicted this because you didn't, he lets me go. I've got a whole lot of, uh, stuff to do. He doesn't say what kind of stuff, but who cares? If it doesn't involve me losing massive amounts of blood, I'm all for it. As Randy disappears around the corner, I breathe a huge sigh of relief. Phew, you! Ahem, <clears throat> um... Guess I'll head home now. Ruby sort of hesitates. I think she's waiting for me to say something. But this feels different from talking to her in class. This is real. I rack my brain for some sort of clever response. Come on, Nate. You can do this! Blurf! Whap! Or maybe you can't do this. Nice going, dipwad. Smooth as a sack of sandpaper. Why didn't I start a conversation? Nate, what was that all about? I feel my cheeks getting warm. What do you mean? Randy, Teddy answers. I was sure he was about to pulverize you. Yeah, Francis chimes in. Then Ruby showed up, and he stopped. That's not typical Randy behavior. He might have thought Ruby would get him in trouble, Teddy suggests. You know, tell a teacher or something? Francis is skeptical. But would that have made him act so unrandy like I doubt it. Well, don't ask me why he let me off the hook. No, ask me. Dee Dee appears, looking at the three of us in her boys are dumber than dirt way. Where'd you come from? Teddy asks. 
A great actress never reveals her secrets, she announces. Oh, brother, did I mention that Dee Dee is the president of the drama club? I suppose you clowns need me to explain what's going on, she says with a sigh. Awkward silence. That means yes. Well, the first thing you need to understand is that Randy has a huge crush on Ruby. What? What? My stomach does a half gainer. Randy likes Ruby? That's just wrong. So obviously he cares what she thinks of him. Here's my theory of what happened, Dee Dee goes on. Randy was about to turn Nate into tofu. Tofu? She's a vegetarian. Then Ruby came along. He wasn't expecting that. He didn't want her to see him acting like a bully. That's why he pretended that he and Nate were just having fun. Some fun, I grumble. He wanted to break my face, but then he took off. If he likes Ruby so much, why didn't he stay and talk to her? Because sometimes, Dee Dee tells us, boys get flustered when they try to speak to girls. Is it that right, Nate? Wink. I don't answer. Dee Dee obviously saw my epic fail with Ruby back there. Maybe she even suspects that Randy's not the only one with a crush on her. But I'm not ready to go public just yet. It's a secret. Do you guys know that Nate likes Ruby too? Doink! Great. Blabby McBlab strikes again. Way to broadcast my private life, Dee Dee. What's next, hanging my underwear on the school flagpole? Anyway, this is big news to Francis and Teddy. Wait a minute. Since when do you like Ruby? Yeah, you've always liked Jenny. They're right. I've been crazy about Jenny since first grade, and the whole school knows that story. But maybe you don't, so here it is. A Jenny for Your Thoughts by Nate Wright it all started five years ago. Welcome to first grade, kiddos, Mrs. Bigby. Find a tag with your name on it. That's where you'll sit. When I found my seat, I was right next to... Johnny? It says Jenny, dummy. Note, my reading wasn't great back then. We quickly became close. Hello, but not as close as I hoped. You smell like socks. For every step forward, Jenny gave me a valentine. There was a step back. She gave me one, too. Me, too. Me, too. Me, too. But I kept on trying. Second grade. Jenny, I saved you a swing. Drop dead. Third grade. Want to eat lunch together? I'd rather starve. Fourth grade. Will you come to my birthday party? Why would I do that? Fifth grade. Can I walk you home? Only if you stay 50 feet behind me. Finally, I was starting to make some progress. If I promise not to talk to you or look at you, can I sit here? Sigh. Whatever. Then, one day... Kids, I'd like to introduce a new student. Mr. Rosa. Our tour has moved here from Belarus. Bella who? Is that near Cleveland? Hi, I'm Jenny. Look! Special appearance by Dan Cupid, love consultant. Aha! A potential couple. Plink! Plunk! Jenny and our tour started spending a lot of time together. Ha <laughs> ha! Really? Yes, sure. But, duh, I didn't realize why. Jenny's making the new kid feel welcome. That's so nice of her. I figured it out at the spring fever dance. Let's rock! School picture guy, a.k.a. DJ Slow Jam. Wanna dance, Jenny? I don't like dancing, Nate. Hello, Jenny. We dance, okay? I'd love to. Later, at the snack table. Did you hear? Our tour asked Jenny to go steady. Huh? And that was that. They were officially a couple. 
They're slow dancing, and it's not even a slow song. I was crushed, but I still had hope. If they break up, I'll be waiting. I made myself a promise. I won't give up on Jenny. Until now. So you're not in love with Jenny anymore? Francis sounds stunned. I don't believe it. Believe it, I say simply. But why? After all this time, Teddy wonders. I don't really know, I admit with a shrug. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized something. Jenny hates me. <laughs> what tipped you off, genius? Teddy cracks. The five years of constant rejection? Francis chuckles. <laughs> She's not very nice to you, that's for sure. But Ruby is, Dee Dee chirps. You two could become the sixth grade's hot new couple. Lick. <laughs> Cut it out, guys, I tell them. I barely even know her yet. But what you do know, you like. Yeah, but she might not like me. She might be in love with Randy. Dee Dee snorts. <laughs> if Ruby's in love with Randy, I'll eat my hat. The one with the antlers? Hey, listen, everyone. Don't tell anybody that I like Ruby. I don't want the whole school yakking about it. Okay, Dee Dee grumbles. I can tell she's disappointed. Yakking is her life. Come on in, guys, I say when we reach my house. We dump our backpacks by the door and pile into the kitchen. Well, hello, kids. How goes it? Good. Good. Fabulous. Anyone for a snack? Dad asks. There's an uncomfortable silence. Dad fact. He's a horrible snack provider. Who wants croutons? Um... I think we're gonna go out and toss the frisbee around, Francis says politely. Yeah, gotta practice for the mud bowl, Teddy adds. Dad's face lights up. Ah, the mud bowl. I was there for the very first one, you know. Really? Did you play in it, Dad? I ask. He smiles. Not only did I play in the mud bowl, I invented it. Chapter 4 Did Dad just say what I thought he said? This might actually be a story worth hearing. Believe it or not, he begins, I was a sixth grader at PS38 many years ago. And many pounds ago. <laughs> what were you like back then? Dee Dee asks in her usual touchy-feely way. Were you in the drama club? Or on the math team? I'm afraid not. I just moved here. I was still learning my way around. Dramatic flashback! One day I was walking home from school. Hey! Martin! That's your name, right? I'm Simon. And I'm Gail. I'm in your math class. Oh, yeah. Hey, you can call me Marty. Only the teachers call me Martin. Okay, Marty it is. We need another player for Ultimate Frisbee. I don't know the rules. We'll teach you. It's fun. That's how Simon, Gale, and the other Frisbee kids became my closest friends. We played Ultimate every day in the park. One afternoon, we had visitors. It was a bunch of kids from Jefferson Middle School. Our rival. Move it. We need this field. But we were here first. Yeah, we're playing ultimate. No, we're playing ultimate. Hey! <laughs> the Jefferson kids were bigger and stronger than we were, and there were more of them, too. There was nothing we could do. Or was there? Come on, gang. We're not going to take this. What? Marty, those guys will kill us. I don't want to fight them. 
I want to challenge them. I never stood up to a bully in my life, but I just couldn't let those Jefferson jerks push us around. Hey, we want our frisbee back. Snicker. Sorry, shrimp boat. We're using it. We'll play you for it. Ooh, we're scared. One game of ultimate. Winner gets the frisbee. It wasn't just about the frisbee. It was for bragging rights. PS38 could never beat Jefferson at anything. This was our chance. You're on, loser. When and where? Tomorrow, after school, right here. News of our grudge match traveled fast. At the park the next afternoon, there were big crowds from both schools. But would there be anything for them to watch? Ugh, rain. The field's turning to mud. Should we call it off? What's wrong, wimps? Afraid of getting dirty? We're not afraid of anything. Let's play ultimate. End of flashback. It absolutely poured for the entire game. That's why we called it the Mud Bowl. Interesting fact about mud, Francis notes. Over time, it hardens into sedimentary rock formations called lutites. Who cares? I shout. Dad, what happened in the game? Who won? I'll show you, answers Dad. He rummages through his desk drawer until he finds what he's looking for, then hands me a yellowing piece of paper. Here's the article from the school newspaper. Bobcats, beef, cavaliers, and ultimate mud bowl. Beef? I think it's supposed to say beat. Even back then, the weekly bugle was totally useless. Read it, Nate. Bobcats, beef, cavaliers, and ultimate mud bowl. Knick-Knack Park. In a severe rainstorm yesterday afternoon, a team of PS38 students defeated Jefferson Middle School 13 to 12 in a super sensational ultimate frisbee game. Because of the wet, sloppy field, players and fans called the contest the Mud Bowl. Marty Wright was the star of the game, making the winning catch in overtime. From midfield, Simon Birch threw a long pass toward the Jefferson end zone. It looked like it couldn't be caught, but Wright sprinted past his defender and made an amazing diving grab to win the game. Bobcat fans went totally nuts. The Jefferson team demanded a rematch, so maybe the Mud Bowl will become an annual event. Marty Wright, grade 6, makes the winning catch in yesterday's Mud Bowl Ultimate Frisbee game against Jefferson. My jaw just about hits the floor. I stare at Dad in total astonishment. You were the hero of the Mud Bowl? Well, it was a team effort. I can't believe this, I continue. I never knew you were actually good at anything. He raises an eyebrow. Thanks so much. Dee Dee's bouncing like a basketball on steroids. You really did invent the Mud Bowl. You weren't just saying that to sound, you know... Dramatic. Right! Dad nods. It's nice to have been there at the beginning. Just like the article says, it's become a yearly thing. And it's always played in lousy weather? Exactly. It's tradition. You know what else is tradition? Losing, Teddy moans. PS38 may have won the first Mud Bowl, but since then, we've lost 36 in a row. That's a winning percentage of point zero two seven. Good to know. Dee Dee speaks up. Well, if we're going to break that losing streak, we'd better do some practicing. Let's go. Woohoo! We chuck the frisbee around until it gets dark, and then the gang takes off. After one of Dad's award-winning dinners, and by the way, chicken fiesta isn't as fun as it sounds, I head up to my room. I've got a lot of homework to do. Eventually. Mud Bowl highlights. What a tremendous catch by Nate Wright. Ooh. The next morning on the way to school, the guys and I are still talking about the Mud Bowl. 
Here's why we're going to win, Teddy says. There have been 37 mud bowls, right? That means this next one is number 38. P.S. 38 has got to win the 38th mud bowl. It's fate. There's no such thing as fate, Francis declares. Life is a series of random events. Not as random as Nate's math homework. Oh, you're a riot. All I'm saying, Francis goes on, is that some things are totally out of your control. Speaking of out of control, here comes Dee Dee. Nate, hey, hi there. What's new? Ready for another day of school? I am. Yep, just another boring day. Why are you acting so weird? I ask her. Me? She says, putting on her little Miss Angel face. I'm not. All I'm doing is saying hello. What's weird about that? Ha <laughs> ha. Hi, Nate. I heard about you and Ruby. There's about ten seconds of radio silence until I can spit out a response. Wh what? Chad beams at me as he ambles off. You guys will make a great couple. A slow burn starts creeping across my cheeks. Who told Chad that I like Ruby? As if I didn't know. <laughs> oh, I can explain. Come with me, I snap, and lead Dee Dee into the library so we can talk in private. Not that private is part of Dee Dee's vocabulary. I've been annoyed at her before, but this is... Fifty levels above that. I'm code red fire alarm, but sweat mad. You were supposed to keep your mouth shut about Ruby. I'm sorry, Nate. I really am. I was chatting with a few kids on the way to school, and it just slipped out. Now everybody's gonna know, I hiss. Dee Dee shakes her head. No, they're not. I only told Chad and two girls from the drama club. Besides them, nobody knows, and nobody's going to know. Psst! Nate! How's Ruby? Ruby dooby doo! I glare at Dee Dee. Got any other predictions? She's at a loss for words. There's a first time for everything. This is a disaster. All I did was tell my best friends that I've got a crush on Ruby now, thanks to Dee Dee's motor mouth. It's practically part of the morning announcements. What was it Francis said about stuff happening that you can't control? Life is a series of random events. Chapter 5 So what's my next step? Do I talk to Ruby and explain why half the school thinks we're an item? Do I try to ignore the whole thing? Or do I... Psst. I'm still peeved at Dee Dee, but one look at her face tells me something's up, and I'm pretty sure it's not a good something. I whirl around. I guess I should have expected this. Randy was about to massage my nose with his knuckles yesterday, and it didn't happen. Now he wants to finish what he started. I wait for one of his cheery one-liners. Prepare to die is one of his favorites. But he doesn't say a word. He just stands there, looking at me. He doesn't even seem mad. This isn't like Randy. It's kind of creepy. Slowly, without ever taking his eyes off me, he reaches down, opens up my backpack, and whoosh! In an instant, the air is filled with my stuff. Notebooks, homework assignments, drawings, you name it. It looks like a ticker tape parade in here. Except nobody's celebrating. Especially not Mrs. Hickson. What on earth? Hickey, that's what I call her, but not to her face, is actually pretty nice. But she goes nuclear if somebody drops a gum wrapper on the floor, so you can imagine how thrilled she is with this little scene. Uh, hi, Mrs. Hickson, I stutter, hoping to calm her down before she unleashes the hounds. Who did this? I turn around to see that Randy's gone. Typical. He never gets in trouble. 
and he's going to weasel his way out of this one, too. If I tell Hickey it was Randy who carpet-bombed the book nook, it'll just give him more incentive to kill me. It makes me sick to let him off the hook. But I have no choice. I've got to confess. It was me! I did it! I was, um, playing a silly joke on Nate, and it got out of hand. Dee Dee lies as I gape at her in shock. Hickey's surprised, too. And here's the good news. She suddenly looks less mad. Well, the library is no place for playing jokes, you two, she begins. But if you clean up this mess, I'll agree to overlook it. Phew! As Hickey walks away, I break into a grateful smile. Thanks, Dee Dee, I say. You didn't have to take the blame. Yes, I did, she answers matter-of-factly. It was my fault that Randy blew up your backpack. Huh? He was still steamed at me for body slamming him yesterday. How's that your fault? I don't think he's mad about what you did. He's mad about who you like. Because he likes her too. That's the part that's my fault, Dee Dee wails. She's not being a drama queen. She's really upset. Randy only knows you've got a crush on Ruby because I told people. I can't stay mad at Dee Dee. It's okay, I tell her. He was going to hear about it eventually. Let's forget it. That might be easier said than done, though. This changes things. Now I'm not just another kid Randy likes to pick on. I'm competition. My stomach lurches as I think about it. I've given him a reason to really hate me. Pleasant thought, right? It rattles around in my head all morning. It's there during social studies. And who won the Battle of Yorktown? Nate? Nate! I can only think of Randy throttling me. English? Or putting me in the trash. Ha! <laughs> Have you finished your essays? Pass them in. And even art. Or just staring at me. It's, uh, interesting. My so-called best friends aren't exactly helpful. Why don't you just let Randy kick your butt? Yeah, Nate, get it over with. T-G-I-L. Thank goodness it's lunchtime. That means I can focus on something besides Randy. Like trading up. Remember when I told you how bad Dad's snacks are? Well, his lunches are even worse. The only way I can get some actual food in me is to find someone crazy enough to trade their lunch for mine. Today's lunch with Chef Dad. Treasure of the sea. Leftover fish casserole served cold, soaked in grease, and lovingly presented in a leaky plastic storage container. Vegetable medley. Zucchini, broccoli, cauliflower, unknown. Why eat only one soggy overcooked veggie when you can choke down four? Overripe fruit du jour. Today's special, a mealy pear covered with eye-catching bruises and seeping puncture marks. Organic muffin. Stir one teaspoon of water into two cups of sawdust, bake until charred and dry. Eat hearty! On the plus side, trying to bargain for something edible is a good way to meet new people. On the minus side, anybody want to trade for this piece of fish? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> See what I'm up against. Glad I could provide a little comic relief while people are stuffing their faces. Meanwhile, I'm starving to death. Where is this sympathy? Nate, can I talk to you? It's Kayla McIntyre. Me? I ask uncertainly. She nods, motioning me over to her table. You know I'm the editor of The Bugle, right? Uh, no. What I do know is that there's a bag of barbecue chips sitting right in front of her. Think she'd trade those for a half-rotten pear? Kayla obviously hasn't noticed that I'm dying of hunger. I was in the library earlier when Randy made that major mess. She goes on. I picked up something I think is yours. Here. Ah! What's hot? 
What's Not at PS38. Hot Cartooning Club. Make Mrs. Godfrey's nose bigger. Not Leaders of Tomorrow. I am in charge. I am. No, me. Hot Sub Number One. Look, kids, I made microwave popcorn. Not Sub Number Two. I still don't understand why she dumped me. I really don't. Hot Jim. When we do actual sports. Soccer time, gang! Yay! Not. Jim. When we do weird stuff. Ready for dynamic movement? Say what? Yep, this is mine. I confirm. Well, I absolutely love it. Kayla tells me. It's funny and it's clever too. Wow, thanks. It's just the sort of thing a school newspaper needs. I know everyone thinks the bugle stinks. She continues, reading my mind. But I'm trying to change that. We need more people to get involved. Involved how? By joining the staff. Nate, I want you to be a columnist for the Weekly Bugle. But what could I write about? It wouldn't just be writing. She explains. You can add drawings too. That's what'll make it unique. It'll be your funny observations about PS thirty eight, interesting people, fascinating trends, stuff like that. Think of it as a school gossip column. I flinch. Gossip isn't exactly my favorite word since the news that I like Ruby went viral. But if I'm the one writing the column, then I'm in charge of the gossip. Okay, I'll do it. Super. You can start with our next issue. I zip over to our regular table and tell Francis and Teddy the big news. Pretty cool, right? I say after giving them all the details. But you're always complaining about how horrible the bugle is. Francis points out. Not any more. My column is going to turn it around. What are you going to call it? Teddy asks. I've got the perfect title. Francis announces. Bugle blasts. Hey, I like that! I exclaim. When something's a blast, that means it's fun, right? And a blast is also the sound a bugle makes. Cool! It's an awesome name. Teddy agrees. What's going to be the subject of your first column? I'm not sure. Maybe some sort of list, like PS thirty eight's best couples, or something like that. Hi, Nate. Ruby, hi. Speaking of couples, I heard you have a really awful lunch today. She giggles. I respond with what's supposed to be a charming laugh, but it ends up sounding like a bizarre burp hiccup combo. Uh, yeah. I finally managed to say. My dad's clueless about lunches. Here, I thought you might like a soda. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye. Hey, hey! Teddy grins after Ruby's out of earshot. That's a good sign. Francis bobs his head in agreement. Yeah, Nate. She would have give you a soda if she didn't like you. My heart pounds. Maybe he's right. I mean, she did sort of make an effort to be nice to me. What does it mean? My brain swirls with thoughts of Ruby as I gaze at the can and pop it open. Fish. Chapter six. Twelve ounces of root beer explode in my face. I drop the can, but the damage is done. I'm soaked. Nothing like taking a soda shower in front of a few hundred people. <laughs> Francis and Teddy know not to laugh. They bust my chops about lots of stuff. Best friends are supposed to do that, but they can tell this isn't your everyday awkward moment. This feels horrible. Here, take these. Leave it to Francis to have a bunch of extra napkins in his lunch bag. As I mop myself off, Teddy gets right to the point. A soda can doesn't blow up like that by accident. I nod miserably. 
I know. What are you saying? Francis asks. Teddy shrugs. I'm saying that Ruby must have booby-trapped the can. What? Uh, that makes no sense, Francis sputters. Didn't we all just agree that Ruby likes Nate? Well, we thought she did, I mutter. My stomach twists into a clammy knot. I wish I could disappear. Francis shakes his head. This is illogical, he says, like he's analyzing a science project gone wrong. Why would Ruby act so nice and then do something so mean? She wouldn't. I saw the whole thing, Dee Dee announces. It wasn't Ruby's fault. Here's what happened. Ruby was just finishing her lunch when Artur walked by. Ah, poor Nate. Huh? Why poor Nate? He has tried to trade with someone his bad lunch, but it does not go very good, I think. Aw, that's so sad. Ew! I haven't had my root beer yet. Do you think Nate might want it? Oh, yes, definite. Ruby left the can on the table and went to throw away her lunch garbage. And that's when I realized I wasn't the only one who'd been listening. Randy shook up the can while Ruby wasn't looking. And then off she went to give it to you. Nate, Ruby had no idea the can was booby-trapped. I feel a jolt of energy go through me. So this was all Randy's doing. I should have known. Ruby wouldn't punk me like that. Dee Dee's detective work just proved it. Maybe Ruby does like me. Hey, wait a minute, Dee Dee. You saw Randy rig the can to explode. Why didn't you stop Ruby from giving it to Nate? Exactly. If Dee Dee had said something, I could have avoided getting a root beer facial. I tried, Dee Dee insists. I was about to run over here, but Mrs. Coletti stopped me. You're not going to leave your table like this, are you? Aha. Uh -huh. Mrs. Coletti's the lunch aide, and when she tells you to clean up, you clean up. She's sort of like Coach John, but with hairier legs. Oop. Speak of the devil. Ahem. Young man, find a mop and get rid of this soda spill. Now. We'll do it, Nate, Dee Dee offers. You go wash yourself off. Good idea. Francis's napkins helped. But I'm still wearing about half a can of root beer. And it's starting to dry into a sticky film. I feel like a candy cane that's been licked all over. I leave the cafetorium, head for the bathroom, and stumble into a meeting of the Hate Nate Club. President Randy Betancourt presiding. Hey, somebody's all wet! What happened, Drippy? As if you didn't know, I growl. Sorry, Randy says with a smirk, but I have no idea what you're talking about. His gruesome groupies snicker on cue. Hardy har, you're so humorous. I wonder what Ruby thought of your little joke. A look of uncertainty flickers across his face, but he recovers quickly. Randy turns to the rest of his gang. Get lost, you guys, he barks. The door closes behind them. One second later, Randy's in my face. You keep your mouth shut about Ruby, he snarls. I'm pretty sure he's about to smack me, but at this point, I'm more mad than scared. I take a deep breath. I just think it's a weird way to show a girl you like her by tricking her into doing your dirty work. Randy's eyes flash angrily and he bears his teeth like a rabid dog. Uh, remember that more mad than scared comment? Forget that. I'm terrified. Then in walks the sheriff. What's going on here? Just so you know, you're witnessing a miracle. Principal Nichols never shows up when I need him. His specialty is showing up when I don't. At parent-teacher conferences... Nate's doing very well in art class, and ah, oh, Mr. Wright, how's that delightful daughter of yours? During the weekend at totally random locations. Well, 
Look who's here! That's my favorite comic book, too! In my nightmares. Walk the plank, you bilge rat! I'll ask again, the big guy thunders. What's going on here? Before I can answer, Randy shifts smoothly into his Mr. Innocent act. I was just using the bathroom, he begins. Then Nate barged in and started yelling at me. Yes, Principal Nichols agrees as he strokes his chin. I did hear shouting. Explain yourself, Nate. Why were you yelling at Randy? Do I really need to tell you what happens next? Randy waltzes back to his posse of pinheads, while Principal Nichols gives me a five-star butt-chewing. Are you sending me to detention? I ask. He ushers me into the hallway. I don't think detention's the answer in this case. It doesn't seem to have kept you from picking on Randy. Say what? This isn't the first time the two of you have clashed. Yes, okay, we've clashed. Because he's a psycho! Is it just PS38, or do all schools have principals this clueless? If you can't stay out of Randy's way, Nate, I'll have to consider other means of discipline. Gulp. Wonder what that means. I'm no fan of detention, but it's probably a cakewalk compared to anything Nichols could come up with. Possibility number one. Massage Mrs. Godfrey's feet until she tells you to stop. Toe funk. Possibility number two. Welcome to the cat room. Possibility number three. If you want to leave the school, you'll have to eat your way out. Through egg salad. My thoughts turn back to Randy. This is totally his fault. What a... Scuzzball, butt nugget, bonehead, doorknob, dipwad, nose wipe, jerk, toolbox. I'm going with all of the above. And if I come up with any more nasty names, dirtbag anyone, I'll add them to the list. The rest of the day isn't much fun. Randy's in all my afternoon classes, so there's no way to avoid him. He's still feeling pretty good about himself thanks to that soda can episode. Sniff, sniff. I smell root beer. He's trying to tick me off. That's obvious. He's hoping I'll snap, have some mega meltdown, and get in more trouble. But I'm not going to give him what he wants. Nope. I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to get even. Chapter 7 after school, I head straight home. No listening to Mrs. Sir Wiki complain about her chronic foot fungus. No practicing for the mud bowl. I'm on a mission. Oh, hi, Nate. Correction. I will be on a mission once Dad moves his double wide out of the way. Are you almost done here? Because I have to... Yep, I've got to go anyway. Hmm. That's not wearing his usual duds from the big and tacky rack at Bargain Barn. How come you're all dressed up? I ask. Oh, it's just a work thing, he says. No big deal. I'll be back in a couple hours. How about bringing home a pizza, Dad? I suggest. We haven't eaten takeout and he cuts me off. No takeout. I'll make dinner for us later. Oh, goody. I can't wait. Another exciting night of frozen peas and bologna bubbles. Not so fun fact. Bologna bubbles are just plain old fried bologna. Dad started calling it that when we were little to make it sound less pathetic. That's strange, Ellen says after Dad leaves. He never wears a suit when he goes to the office. True. Dad's got one of those jobs where he works from home half the time, and he dresses pretty casual around the house. I mean, he spent yesterday in a pair of boxers and a bald is beautiful t-shirt so it's weird to see him decked out like your friendly neighborhood mannequin. I don't want to dress fancy for a job. I want a job like Gordy's. FYI, Gordy is Ellen's boyfriend. And yes, that does call his mental stability into question. But you can tell he's got all his marbles because he works at Classic Comics in the mall. Comic store employee is number five on my list of all-time dream jobs. 
Here are my top four. Four. Principle of PS38. But, but, what part of you're fired don't you understand? Three. Cheese Doodle Taste Consultant. This latest batch needs just a smidge more cheddar. Brilliant! Two. World Famous Cartoonist. We'll pay you a million dollars for the next issue of Dr. Cesspool. Make it two million. One. All Powerful Superhero. Orphaned puppies kidnapped by aliens. This is a job for Ultronate! I wish you did have Gordy's job, Ellen Grouse's. It's our six-month anniversary this weekend, and he has to work. Wow, I say. You guys have been going out for six months? Not that I really care, but give me a minute here. This is research. Um, how did you two get together in the first place? What do you mean? Well, what did Gordy say to let you know he liked you? Why are you asking? No reason, I was just... cough. Curious. And wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ellen's eyes light up and she flashes an obnoxious grin. You like somebody. And you're trying to figure out how to tell her. I'm right, aren't I? Shut up. I snap, my cheeks burning. I was just making conversation, that's all. Never mind. Oh, come on, Romeo. Who's the unlucky girl? Are you still hung up on what's your face? Jenny? No! Leave me alone! Ellen scowls. Hey, don't bite my head off. You're the one who brought it up. Good luck getting a girl to like you with that attitude. She stalks off, which is fine with me. Big sisters are such a waste of oxygen. Meanwhile... I'm still pretty confused about this whole Ruby situation. I know I like her, but does she like me? Or does she like Randy? Ugh! Suddenly a picture of Randy and Ruby smooching in slow motion flashes through my mind. It's sickening, but it's just what I needed. It helps me focus on the job at hand. Revenge! Draw, draw, draw. Right, 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 right. Draw, 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 draw. The next morning before homeroom, I find Kayla in the library. Here's my first column for the newspaper. Great. It'll be a while till we're ready to print. Okay, I'll wait. And wait. And wait some more. Remember, this is the ha-ha weekly bugle. It's actually almost... Two weeks before the next issue, featuring the awesome debut of yours truly, finally comes out. Read all about it! Let's skip Gina's thrilling profile of Mrs. Sir Wiki with the headline, Detention Monitor Keeps Working Despite Mysterious Skin Rash, and go straight to the main attraction. Bugle Blasts by Nate Wright. All the news that fits, I print. Greetings, readers! Welcome to a new column that will keep you plugged in to all the latest news at PS38. Let's get started with an exclusive romance report. Derek and Melissa have eaten lunch together for three straight days. Everyone's wondering, is love on the menu? Telltale sign, they're feeding each other. A loud argument between Austin and Lucy in the book nook meant two things. One... Their relationship could be on the rocks. You never listen! Stop saying that! Two, they got kicked out of the library. Overheard on Monday near the science lab, Bethany drops an F-bomb on Leo. You're a super nice guy and everything, but I just want to be friends. Overheard on Tuesday by the trophy case, Leo bounces back quickly. Wanna hang out later? Didn't you just get dumped by Bethany? Time for Teacher Tidbits! How well do you know the members of PS38's faculty? These facts will amaze you. A certain social studies teacher loves horseback riding, which leads to the question, is the horse okay? Gasp! This fossilized science instructor once tried a perm back when he actually had hair. 
Talk about a failed experiment. Hello, ladies. Get lost. A psychotic employee of the phys ed department is currently undergoing treatment for chronic flatulence. All right, scrubs, line up, Black. And now it's time to play Guess That Guy. Use these five clues to unmask the mystery student. One, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. And if we multiply two negative numbers, what happens? Uh, George Washington? Two, his nose is humongous. Three, he has really, really bad breath. Hi there. Ugh. <laughs> Four, he's always picking on smaller kids. Let me copy your homework, or else. What homework? I'm in kindergarten. Five, he is a total weasel. Doof. Ow! Principal Nichols, Nate just kicked me. Bonus clue. Our mystery student's name rhymes with Schmandy Schmettencourt. That's all for this time. Read the next edition of the Weekly Bugle for another installment of Bugle Blasts. I can tell right away I've got a hit on my hands. Did you see this? <laughs> it's a riot. Finally, something funny in the newspaper. The hallways are packed with kids reading the bugle, and they're all cracking up. I'm getting high fives all over the place, even from Leo. <laughs> Dude, this is so me. Nate, guess that guy is hilarious. I guess it right away. Did you hear that? That's the best part. People love that I called out Randy. The principal might not realize what he's really like, but the kids do. It was time for someone to say something. Hey! You're dead. Randy shoved me. Fight! 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 I'm not stupid. I knew that as soon as Randy saw bugle blasts, he'd go completely scooters. But I guess I just reached the end of my rope. He's been doing the same garbage for so long and never taking the blame for it that I finally decided to fight back. Of course, I was hoping to avoid any actual fighting. No such luck. Boys, stop this! Stop it now! Principal Nichols shows up about two minutes too late, as usual. And right away, Randy launches into his I'm a victim act. Nate attacked me! What? No, I didn't! Ahem. <clears throat> Mr. Nichols, may I have a word with you? It's Ms. Dempsey, the school counselor. Without taking her eyes off Randy, she leans in close to the principal and whispers something. He listens, nods a couple times, and turns toward us. Boys, go to my office and wait for me there. Five minutes later, the big guy is parked behind his desk, giving us both the evil eye. Let's start with you, Randy. Would you like to change your account of how the fight started? Randy shoots me a murderous glance before mumbling. I jumped on him. Mm-hmm. Yes, that confirms what Miss Dempsey told me, Principal Nichols says. And Nate, what do you suppose made Randy angry enough to assault you that way? There's a copy of the Weekly Bugle right there on his desk. It's no use playing dumb. I, uh, made fun of him in the newspaper. In other words, Principal Nichols concludes, both of you bear some responsibility for this problem, which means you should both play a part in the solution. Uh, what's that supposed to mean? Please tell me he's not talking about one of those stupid team-building activities they make us do every year on the first day of school. Okay, kids. Pass the orange around the circle without using your hands or feet. Miss Dempsey has suggested that the two of you try peer counseling, Principal Nichols tells us. Peer counseling? Sometimes a fellow student is better at solving these sorts of disputes than an adult is, he explains. Randy looks as thrilled about this as I am. 
You mean we have to tell some student shrink why we hate each other? Principal Nickel smiles. Or grimaces. Hard to tell which. Something like that, he says. He presses the intercom button on his desk. Mrs. Shapolsky, he says. Send in the peer counselor. Chapter 8 Please let it be someone good. Please let it be someone good. Please let it... Ah! Hello, Gina! Ah! Principal Nichols glares at me, and there's an edge to his voice. Is something wrong, Nate? Wrong? Oh, you mean like finding out my peer counselor is the bride of Frankenstein? No. Everything's just peachy. Good, that's more like it. Now... Let's proceed. The three of you will meet after school today to begin a dialogue, he explains. A dialogue. Great. I can hear it now. I hate you. I hate you more. You're a butt face. You're a double butt face. I love the honesty. Gina's gone through the counselor training, Principal Nichols says. She'll be in charge. I expect you both to listen to her. Oh, I'm sure they will. Ugh, this is awful. I've had bad dreams before. Professionally figure skating with Ellen, marrying Kim Cressley, being stuck on a desert island with Mrs. Godfrey, being on stage in only my underwear. But this is no dream. It's as real as a boot in the backside. Just as enjoyable. Principal Nichols wraps up his instructions. Gina and Randy walk out, but before I can make my escape, the big guy pounces. Just a moment, Nate. We're not quite done. I swallow hard. Now what? He points to his copy of the bugle. In your column, you did more than take pot shots at Randy. You also poked fun at some teachers in a way that crossed the line. My mouth goes dry. Well, yeah, but I didn't mention any of them by name. But you were pretty clear about which teachers you meant, weren't you? Uh-huh, I murmur, looking at the floor. There's a long silence. Nate? You're a talented cartoonist. It's wonderful that you're so skilled at using humor to express yourself. But the jokes needn't always come at the expense of others. Nobody likes to be made a fool of, son. Wait for it. Here it comes. He's going to suspend me, or put me on probation, or... That's all. You may go. My head's spinning as I shuffle out. I've got the usual queasiness I always feel after a shame thon with the principal. Nate, great column in the newspaper. Yeah, I laugh my socks off. But I have to admit, I'm still kind of pumped by all the rave reviews for bugle blasts. If everyone keeps telling me how awesome I am, who am I to say they're wrong? Whap! Ow! What was that for? Francis scowls. We just heard you've got peer counseling after school. Don't remind me, I grumble. Nate, we're supposed to practice for the mud bowl after school. We can't be Jefferson without a full team. Oops, I forgot about mud bowl practice. Not only that, Teddy adds, you're missing a chance to hang out with your dream girl. Wait, what? Ruby, join the team, pinhead. She'll be at practice, and you won't. My stomach sinks like a brick in a bathtub. I'm starting to feel like the dope who guesses wrong on one of those TV game shows. Welcome back to Choose or Lose. I'm your host, Jack Potts. Here's our next contestant, Nate Wright. As you can see, there are three doors on stage. Behind one of the doors is the chance to play Ultimate Frisbee with your friends and, ahem, someone special. Behind another door is the revolting experience of peer counseling with two of your most hated rivals. And behind another door is a year supply of rice pilaf. 
Okay, Nate. It's time to choose or lose. Will you pick door number one, door number two, or door number three? Um, I'll try door number three, Jack. Fingers crossed. Okay, let's open door number three. Oh no! You're stuck with peer counseling. Disappointing trombone music. Sorry, Nate. Better luck next time. Thanks for playing. Choose or lose. Rice pilaf, anyone? End. I try not to think about it, but there's a clock in every classroom, and each tick brings me one second closer to couples therapy with Gina and Randy. It's a countdown to misery until, Nate. Oh, hi, Ruby. Everyone's saying that you and Randy had a fight. Uh huh, we did. She looks puzzled. But I thought the two of you were friends. Remember that day I saw you and him wrestling, and and Randy said we were just messing around. I say. Yeah, I remember. But we're not friends. We're more like. The opposite of friends, actually. Oh, how come you guys don't get along? I hesitate. I don't really want to tell Ruby about all the times Randy's punked me over the years. That'll make me sound like wee willy weeny. Instead, I pull a copy of the newspaper out of my notebook and flip it open to bugle blasts. Read the part called "Guess That Guy." It'll explain everything. Giggle. So this made him mad at you, huh? I roll my eyes. He's always mad at me, but this definitely kicked it up a notch. Ruby shrugs. He never seems mad around me. Whoa! What's that supposed to mean? Is she sending me some sort of coded message? Girl talk translator. Does this? He never seems mad around me. Means this? I am hopelessly in love with him, and you're a complete dork. So, uh, do you and Randy hang out a lot, or? Well, we ring. Rats! So much for that conversation. It's time for science, and Ruby and I are stuck at different lab stations for the whole period. I try to catch up with her after class, but ahem, where do you think you're going? Remember what Principal Nichols said? Gina's in charge, and she knows it too. Gag me. I'm going to peer counseling. That's right. Be in the counselor's room in two minutes. Don't be late. Fine, but I'm not going to be early either. As I stroll leisurely downstairs, I spot the mud bowl team heading off to practice. Guys. I'll catch up with you as soon as I can. They don't answer. Guess they couldn't hear me. Trying to ignore the hollow feeling in my chest, I slip into Miss Dempsey's office. Gina and Randy are already there. This is stupid. Randy mutters under his breath. For once, he and I agree about something. The last thing I need is more counseling. Wait. Did he say more counseling? Gina ignores him. Let's get started, she says briskly, handing us paper and pencil. I'd like each of you to record your impressions of one another. Impressions? Randy repeats. Did I mention he's not very bright? Yes, impressions. The things you notice about someone include everything, good and bad. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, not really. It's no problem listing all the bad stuff. But how am I supposed to write about Randy's good qualities? Does he have any? Time's up. Uh, hold it. I protest. I'm not done. Sorry, Gina says, managing to sound not sorry at all. We're on a schedule. She collects our sheets and examines them briefly. Now you'll exchange papers, Gina announces. She hands mine to Randy and his to me. Isn't it interesting to see what other people think of you? Chapter Nine. As I stare at the page, the blood starts pounding in my head. 
I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's an outrage! You look upset, Gina says, a smirk tugging at the corners of her mouth. Is something wrong? Yes, something's wrong. This, I say. Randy drew me drawing alternate. Except in his picture, I have goofy hair, earwax, and a snotty nose. And then I'm saying... I'm Nate Wright. Please pay attention to me. You know what's cool? Making fun of people. I think I'm smarter than everyone else, but actually I'm a moron. My favorite hobby is bragging about myself. Ever notice what a wuss I am? Is this a joke? I snarl at Randy. He grins. You tell me. I don't think it's funny. His face twists into a mask of bogus concern. Oh no! Someone drew a cartoon about Nate, and he doesn't think it's funny! I search for a snappy comeback, but can't find one. Randy points at the drawing in my hand. What if I put that cartoon in the bugle for the whole school to see? And what if I gave it a clever title? Like, Name That Nerd. Would that make it funny? This isn't fair. He's acting like I drew Guess That Guy for no reason. I only did that because you were such a jerk, I protest. I'm a jerk to you because you're a jerk to me. You were a jerk to me first. That's enough. We're getting nowhere. Gina declares in full know-it-all mode. Let's try something else. So we do. We try everything. Role-playing. And action. I am a lion with a thorn in my paw. And I am a tiny mouse. Let me help you. Okay, this is lame. Word association. I'll say a word, then you say the first word that pops into your head. Nate, wimp. Friend, never. Respect, can I go now? Trust games. You have to believe that Randy will catch you. Okay. Whoop. Oops. Nothing works. By the end of the session, two things are obvious. One, I can't believe I missed mud bowl practice for this. And two, Randy and I still hate each other. Aha! I have an idea. There's a field trip next week. No kidding, genius. The whole sixth grade is going to the science museum. What does that have to do with peer counseling? Mr. Galvin always makes kids pair up on field trips, Gina explains. I'm going to make certain that you two are partners. That way, you'll have to work together. Randy's as horrified as I am. But what can we do? Thanks to Principal Nichols, Gina's calling all the shots. We can't even burp without her permission. Uh-oh. Permission! I just remembered. I haven't asked Dad to sign the permission slip for the field trip yet. Do I want to be Randy's partner? No! But would I rather skip the field trip altogether? No way! Staying at school during field trips means spending the day with Mrs. Jones, a.k.a. Mrs. Drones. And that's when I discovered the wonderful world of scrapbooking. Let me show you the album from my trip to the quilting festival. This should only take a few hours. I can see the headline now. Student bored to death by classroom aid. I make sure the permission slips in my backpack and start home. Dad, will you sign this so I can go to the science museum? Here you go. Uh, hold it, I say, pointing to a blank space. You need to fill in your phone number at work. I wrote down her home phone, he says. Yeah, but the field trip is on a Wednesday, and you always go to the office on Wednesday, so... My voice trails off as I look at Dad. He's got an expression on his face that's... Well, I don't know what it is. I've never seen that face before. Sigh. Nate... Go get your sister. Family meeting. Bulb? Okay. Family meetings are either really good or really bad, and Dad wasn't smiling back there. As I enter Ellen's room, an alien world of strawberry lip gloss and stuffed panda bears, I feel a cold knot forming in my belly. Something is not right. Family meeting. About what? Do I look psychic? Come in, kids. 
Sit down, Dad says, motioning to the sofa. Ellen sits. I don't. I'm too nervous. Dad clears his throat. Ahem. <clears throat> I've been trying to figure out how to say this, but there is no easy way. So, I'll just come out with it. I lost my job. The company laid me off last month. Wait, this doesn't add up. Last month, I say. But we saw you go into the office just a couple weeks ago. Remember that day you were all dressed up? I wasn't going to the office. I had a job interview. I've been going to lots of interviews lately, Dad continues, trying to find a job locally. Staying here would be my first choice. First choice? Ellen echoes, her voice sounding thin. What's the second choice? Dad takes a deep breath. Well, there is a company that wants to hire me in California. It feels like all the airs left the room. California? I repeat. So, we're moving? Ellen whispers. Dad smiles. Saddest smile ever. Unless I can find work here in town. Yes, honey, I'm afraid we'll have to. Ellen turns and runs out of the room. I hear her feet thundering up the stairs her door slamming, the floor creaking as she throws herself onto her bed. I can tell she's crying into her pillow, because I recognize the sound. It's like a humpback whale having an asthma attack. I look at Dad. You could still find a job around here, though, right? I mean, there's still hope. Isn't there? I suppose so, he answers quietly. Then his voice takes a U-turn, suddenly all fake cheer and confidence. We'll be okay. No matter what happens, I promise it'll be okay. He goes into the kitchen to burn dinner. I wander outside and collapse on the lawn. Did you hear how he put that? No matter what happens. That's dad speak for expect the worst. Heads up, Tong. Sorry, Nate. You'll need to do better than that in the mud bowl. Hey, tell us about peer counseling, Dee Dee says as the gang flops down beside me. Yeah, give us details, Teddy chimes in. Did the three of you have lots of group hugs? <laughs> it was fine, I mumble. You don't look like it was fine. Yeah, what's wrong, Nate? I shake my head. Nothing. Everything's good. I know what you're thinking. These are my best friends, so why not tell them I might be moving 3,000 miles away? I can't really explain it. I know they'd all try to make me feel better. California is fascinating, meteorologically speaking. The average temperature is... In a few years after I become a star in Hollywood, we can be neighbors. Here's a joke that'll cheer you up. A duck walks into a barber shop. But what if I'm not ready to feel better? I only found out about this California plan two minutes ago. The last thing I want to do is talk about it. So I won't. I'll change the subject. How was practice? I ask. Good. Ruby fit right in. Ahem. And speaking of Ruby, she and I had a little talk. And just as I thought, she likes you. She said you're really nice, and she loves your sense of humor. She thinks you're cute, too. She even likes your hair. So this girl is literally one in a million, Teddy cracks. Everyone laughs, except me. I guess this is why people say timing is everything. Yesterday, I would have been ecstatic to learn that Ruby likes me. But now? Francis elbows me in the ribs. Well? When are you going to ask her out? I get to my feet. I'm not. I thought I liked Ruby, but I changed my mind. Chapter 10 What's with you lately, Nate? 
Francis asks as we arrive at school on Wednesday morning. Why are you being such a sad sack? Isn't it obvious? Today's the field trip. Nate has to be partners with Randy. Dee Dee's half right. The field trip is today, but Randy's barely a blip on my radar screen. Besides, soon he'll be out of my life forever, along with everyone else. All sixth graders report to the bus circle for the trip to the science museum. I still haven't told anybody I'm moving. I guess I'm hoping for a last-minute miracle, but Dad's only got one more job interview lined up. If that doesn't pan out, California, here I come. I spot Ruby up ahead as we board the bus, and my insides go into a death spiral. Obviously, I was lying when I said I'd changed my mind about her. I still think she's awesome. But what's the point of telling her how I feel when I'm never going to see her again? It's a 20-minute ride to the museum, but thanks to Mary Ellen Papowski, it seems longer. 18th first, same as the verse. Row, row, row your boat. Come on, people, it's a sing-along. Finally, we pull up to the entrance and stream into the lobby. And even though I'm in a cruddy mood... This does look like a cool place to roam around. Until Captain Killjoy drops a turd in the punch bowl. No goofing off, Mr. Galvin announces. We're here to learn. We all groan. Why are teachers always so hung up on learning stuff? All the information you need to complete these work booklets is right here in the museum. Find your assigned partner and get started. You heard the man. Gina insists, steering me toward Randy. Time for some teamwork! He and I exchange angry glares. Let's get this over with, he grunts. Where do we go first? I glance at the booklet. The entomology exhibit. Entomology is the study of insects. I know what entomology is, Randy gripes. I'm not an idiot. I didn't say you were an idiot. I was reading from the booklet. Oh, uh, well, my bad then. We have to find a Titanus giganteus, also called a Titan beetle. Then we have to draw it. You handle that part, he tells me. That's so, Randy, trying to weasel out of doing any work. Why me? Why don't you do it? Because you're better at drawing than I am, pinhead. Oh, Right, um, thanks. Wait, did that sound like I was thanking Randy for calling me a pinhead? Because that's not what I meant. I think I was just in shock that he paid me a compliment. Sort of. He scans the booklet. There's a jillion questions in here. If we split up, it'll go faster. That actually makes sense. You do page one, I'll do page two. He wanders off and I take the elevator up to entomology. I find the Titan Beetle in a glass display case and start drawing. Hey, this gives me an idea for my next Ultra Nate comic. Killer Beetles take over the school. Ding! The elevator opens, and a bunch of students pour out. They're not from PS38, though, so I don't pay much attention as the group files past. Then, something grabs my attention. One of the kids is wearing a familiar jacket. Purple and gold with a big J on the chest. J? For Jefferson. Ugh, it figures. We go on one stinking field trip a year, and the evil empire is here on the same day. I give them a subtle but still devastating hairy eyeball as they file past. They're too busy being obnoxious to notice. I turn back to my drawing. Rats. Beetles are tough to draw. What's wrong, Vincent Van Goober? Having trouble coloring inside the lines? Uh-oh. It's Nolan. We've crossed paths before. During the winter when PS38 had to relocate to Jefferson for a while, he wasn't exactly driving the welcome wagon. Now, here he is again, as friendly as ever. Let me see. Ooh, a bug. Give that back, I demand. He ignores me and stuffs it in his pocket. Tell me, wussbag, is it true? 
is what true? Are you on PS38's Mud Bowl team? So what if I am? I answer, trying not to focus on the fact that he's about a foot taller than me. He pokes me hard in the chest. We're going to destroy you. Yeah, like you destroyed us in the snowdown when you couldn't win even though you cheated? His face darkens. You're going down, he hisses. Not just in the mud bowl, but right now. Hey! Leave him alone. Why should I? Nolan sneers. Do the math, Randy says matter-of-factly. There's only one of you and two of us. Okay, am I the only one who thinks this is bizarre? Randy Betancourt, PS38's poster boy for bullying, is sticking up for me. And you know what? It's working. Nolan starts to inch away. Two against one, he sputters. Real fair. Huh, I say, finding my voice again. Funny how you're worried about fairness all of a sudden. I'm not worried about anything. We'll settle this at the mud bowl. Nolan disappears. I knock the dust off my clothes and turn to Randy. Uh, ahem. Thanks. He waves me away impatiently. Whatever. The guy's a scumbag. I spot my pencil on the floor and with a groan remember the booklet. Ah, he took my paper. What? Nolan, he took it. Half our booklet's gone. Randy slumps onto a nearby bench. So we'll get an F. Great. That's just what I need. Maybe Mr. Galvin has an extra booklet. I can't get another bad grade. Then I'll have to talk about it with the counselor. Counselor? You mean Miss Dempsey? His cheeks turn a blotchy pink. Never mind, it's none of your business. How can you go to counseling? His voice is expressionless. Because my grades stink. And my parents are getting a divorce, so there. Shut up. Randy looks miserable. I should probably keep quiet, but I feel something working its way from my lungs to my throat to my mouth. I can't stop it. All of a sudden, my voice has a mind of its own. I think I'm moving to California. Randy can't hide his surprise. You are? I nod. My father says it's not a hundred percent, but it's pretty close. He frowns. It's no fun. I can tell you that. Huh? When have you ever moved? I move every week, he says, spitting out the words as he rises from the bench. From my mom's house to my dad's and back again. I'm no counselor, but something tells me now's a good time to leave Randy alone. I zip down to the lobby, and it turns out Mr. Galvin does have some extra booklets. I have to run around like my undies are on fire, but I finish page one just before it's time to leave. So, Randy and I won't get an F. Or an A, either, based on this beetle drawing. Ooh, is that a platypus? Mary Ellen tries to get another round of campfire songs going during the trip back to school, but I'm focusing on the mud bowl. It could be the last game I ever play as a bobcat, and we'll probably get crushed. How do you know? Have you seen Jefferson play? I shake my head. No, but last year they beat us 25 to 6, remember? And they were big, Teddy adds. They had some kids who could throw that disc a mile. That's what our team needs, I say as the bus slows to a stop in front of PS38. Someone who can really fling it. That reminds me, let's practice after school. You don't have peer counseling again, do you? Teddy asks me. No, I've had enough Randy time for one day. Once you've put your booklets on my desk, you're dismissed. A few minutes later, the battle and bobcats are out on the soccer field. Francis, Teddy, Dee Dee, Chad, and Ruby. And me. Awkward. Ahem. That was a fun field trip, don't you think? Hmm? Oh! Yeah, really fun except for the part where Nolan tossed me around like a sock puppet. Nate! K!
Catch! Teddy launches a disc in my direction, but the wind catches it. It bangs to the left, farther and farther off course until... Clunk! It lands right next to Randy. With an expert flick of the wrist, Randy sends the disc my way. It doesn't wobble. It doesn't curve. I don't even have to move. I just hold up my hands. Thunk! Wow! It's a perfect throw. Perfect! It's exactly the kind of throw Jefferson can make, and we can't. I don't hesitate. I sprint over to Randy. I can't believe I'm asking this, but... How'd you like to play in the mud bowl? Chapter 11 Let me get this straight, Francis whispers. You want to put Randy on the team? Yeah. Why? Teddy chimes in. You spend a couple hours with the guy on a field trip, and all of a sudden you're best friends? We're not best friends, I assure them. I just think he can help us win. Don't you guys want to beat Jefferson? On the skeptometer, they're giving me looks that are somewhere between, I'm not so sure about this, and you're out of your mind. But finally, Francis caves. Well, he sighs, I guess we could try it. Okay, you're in. Let's play. Just your everyday epic plot twist. A week ago, Randy wanted to pound my face in. Now, we're teammates. It's kind of freaky. But asking him to join us seems like a win-win. He gets to take his mind off his parents' divorce, and we increase our chances of winning the Mud Bowl. That's assuming we even get to the Mud Bowl. We have to survive practice first. After just a few minutes, I can see that having Randy on the team will definitely take some getting used to. One... He throws too hard. Oh! Two, he has lousy people skills. Uh, hello? The point is to catch it. Three, he's a total show-off. Oops, I didn't mean to grab that behind my back. It just happened. Francis and I are taking a water break when Dee Dee joins us. I couldn't help but notice that Randy is making all his most acrobatic plays right in front of Ruby, she mutters under her breath. Yeah, I grumble. He sure is. Well, what do you care? Francis asks me. You told us you don't like Ruby anymore. Oh, uh, I, I don't, I stammer. I was just, you know, watching Randy do his thing. He's unbelievable. Francis nods. He really is a good player. It might take him a while to fit in, but... I think you were right. He'll help us against Jefferson. Come on, let's get back out there. Uh, Nate and I will be along in a second. Francis trots onto the field. Dee Dee waits until he's out of earshot. You can fool everyone else, she declares, poking my shoulder. But not me. What are you talking about? Dramatic sigh. Huge eye roll. I'm talking about this act you're putting on. I know you still like Ruby. Why are you pretending you don't? I try to avoid eye contact. Dee Dee's not easy to lie to. I have my reasons. But if you both like each other, why, just leave it alone, okay? By next week, it won't even matter if we like each other or not. Whoops. Probably shouldn't have gone there. Dee Dee pounces like Chad on a cupcake. Next week? What do you mean? What's happening next week? She's not going to let this go. And you know what? I'm not sure I want her to. I've been keeping this bottled up long enough. Maybe it's time to finally say something. I take a deep breath. I move honk! Huh? What's Dad doing here? He never picks me up at school. Um, I'll be right back. I tell Dee Dee as I jog over to the car. Dad greets me with a smile. How is the science museum? He asks. Fine, I answer. But come on, he didn't drive here to quiz me about a stinking field trip. So, what's up? Brace yourself. I got a job!
A sickening layer of dread settles over me. So it's official. My mouth goes bone dry as I confirm the horrible news. The... The one in California? Nope, not that one. It's a job here in town! Here? In? Town! Dad's still talking. Remember how I still had one interview left? Well, it was this morning, and... So we're not moving? Sorry, I know it's rude to interrupt, but I've got to hear Dad say it, just to be sure. He chuckles. <laughs> we're not moving. Yes! <laughs> I run back to my friends. I'm not moving! I can't stop myself! I tackle hug Francis! I am not moving! I declare again. From under me, Francis grumbles. We're so happy for you. I didn't know you were moving, Chad says. I only thought I was, I jabber happily. The words tumble out of me as I relate the whole story. I can't believe you kept this a secret. Aha, no wonder you've been in such a funk lately. Yeah, but now I've been defunct. That's great, Nate. I'm glad you're staying put. For a second, don't laugh. I think I might faint. My legs feel like they're made of pudding. I lift a hand to my cheek and hold it there as my mind reels in happy surprise. Ruby just kissed me. Cue the fireworks, people. This is incredible. Let's celebrate. Yeah, how about we go to Crazy Code for an ice cream? Um, I hesitate as I see Randy walk off alone. You guys go ahead. I'll meet you there. Mind if I sit here? Randy shrugs. It's a free country. I flop down on the grass. There's a long silence. When he speaks again, he can't hide the bitterness in his voice. Ruby was pretty happy you're not moving. She likes you. I guess so, I answer. Are you going to put that in your gossip column? Read all about it. Nate and Ruby are a couple, and Randy's a loser. No, I tell him. I won't do that. What's stopping you? Good question. What is stopping me? Maybe I'm figuring out that there's some stuff you just don't gossip about. Or I could be remembering how Randy saved me from Nolan at the museum. Maybe I just feel sorry for the guy. I don't know. We're teammates now, I say finally. He snorts. <laughs> some teammates. We hate each other. Not as much as we used to, I remind him. And not nearly as much as we hate Jefferson. Don't you want to stick it to that Nolan kid? He nods, a grin slowly creasing his face. Yeah, I'd like that. But they'll be tough to beat. So, let's go meet the gang at the Crazy Cone and talk strategy. Rumble. Thunder, Randy says. He squints up at the dark clouds rolling across the sky. It's going to rain. Good. Bring it on. This is Mud Bowl weather. Chapter 12 The Mud Bowl's not a holiday that happens at the same time every year. Tradition says it has to be played in the rain. So you wait for a real gully washer to come along, and then it's time to rumble! Look how sloppy it is! That's sort of the point, Chad. Let's set the scene, sports fans. It's Friday afternoon. It's been raining for 48 hours, and the 38th annual Mud Bowl is about to begin. PS38 Bobcats versus Jefferson Cavaliers. Wow. They're big, Ruby says as we take our positions. She's right. Did Jefferson's whole sixth grade class stay back a year? Or three? Francis claps his hands. Let's go over defensive assignments. Dee Dee, you cover the girl with the headband. Teddy, take the kid with the buzz cut. I shoot my hand up. I'll take Nolan. 
Francis fidgets. Okay, he says after a long pause. We'll see how it goes. See how it goes? What does that mean? You ready? Oh, yeah. Ready to spank you for the 37th year in a row? Go ahead and try. Randy heaves the disc toward Jefferson's end zone and the game's on. If you've ever played Ultimate, you know it's pretty simple. The goal is to score points, and you do that by getting the disc into the other team's end zone. But you can't run with the disc. You can only score by throwing and catching, which Jefferson's really, really good at. Ha! Score! Cavaliers one, Bobcat zero. Yikes, that was fast. Dee Dee leaps around like a deranged cheerleader. Don't worry, gang, we'll get him back. But we don't. On our first possession, Randy lofts a high floater in Ruby's direction, and Jefferson intercepts, and then Nolan scores again. Nice try, scrub. Next time, bring a ladder. That makes it 2-0. And minutes later, after Nolan snags another scoring pass high above my head, it's 3-zip. This is a disaster. Francis turns to the referee. Time out! We huddle up. Let's change a few things, he announces, before they blow us off the field. Randy, you're going to cover Nolan. What? But I'm covering Nolan. Francis nods. I know, and he scored three straight times. Good thing my face is so dirty. I'm pretty sure that underneath all this mud, my cheeks are turning fire engine red. It's okay, Nate, Ruby says. He's too tall for you, that's all. They're all teams too tall. Teddy points out. Exactly, Francis agrees. Which is why you have to change the way you throw. Randy's expression sours. I thought you guys liked the way I throw. We do, but so does Jefferson. See how they keep out-jumping us? That's because you're throwing it too high. Keep your passes low. The game starts up again, with Randy guarding Nolan. I'm still bummed out about getting reassigned but it doesn't take long to see that Francis was right. Randy's big enough to slow down Nolan's scoring streak, and the mighty Bobcats start chipping away at Jefferson's lead. They're still taller than we are, duh, but we're quicker and craftier. As the game moves into the second half, we start to creep up on them. There's just one problem, and it's a whopper. I see what's going on here, and unless I say something... I don't think we can win this game. I signal to the ref. Time out! Hear that, Bobcats? Huddle up! Francis calls. No, I tell him. This isn't a team thing. It's between me and Randy. Randy gives me a quizzical glance as we slosh over to the sideline. This could be awkward. I guess the best thing to do is just come out and say it. You're passing to Ruby a lot. His shoulders stiffen. So? She's a good player. Yeah, I explain. But you're passing to her when she's not even open. Jefferson knows it's coming. They've intercepted you four times already. Randy doesn't say anything. But he doesn't slug me either. Might as well plow ahead. Listen, I get it, I say quietly. You like her, so you're, you know, paying extra attention to her. You're thinking maybe then she'll like you. There's a long pause. He kicks at the ground. What do you know about it? You've never liked someone who didn't like you back. I gape at him in disbelief. Oh, uh, hello. I spent half my life chasing after Jenny, remember? Trust me. I know how it feels. It stinks. Randy's eyes look a little watery but that might be because we're standing in the middle of a monsoon. Whatever, he mutters. I guess it was crazy, me thinking that Ruby might like me. No, it wasn't, I say. Me trying to play defense against Nolan, that was crazy. But you can handle him. Thanks to you, we can win this thing. Now let's get out there and do it. The game rolls on. Twice we get to within a point of Jefferson... 
and twice we fall back. Then, with less than two minutes to go, Francis makes a sliding catch in the end zone. Tie game, 19 to 19. But hold everything. Jefferson gets the disc and starts to motor down the field as time bleeds off the clock. If they score, we might not have time for a comeback. With 20 seconds left, they flip a pass toward the flag. Flub. And Nolan drops it. Randy takes over. He snatches up the disc and turns to me. Go! He shouts. I sprint up the swampy field with Nolan on my heels. We can win this game right now. If Randy can chuck that disc all the way to the end zone, and if I can catch it. As I look over my shoulder, I can barely see Randy 50 yards behind me, stepping into his throw with a loud grunt. I peer through the sheets of swirling rain until... Yes! I spot the disc, curving in a wobbly arc toward the corner flag. Gotta get there! I sprint. I can hear Nolan right behind me. At the last second, I jump and catch! Yes! Bettencourt and Wright team up to win first Mupp Bowl in 37 years. Knickknack Park. For the first few minutes of Friday's epic Mud Bowl against Jefferson Middle School, things didn't look so good for the team from PS38. They fell behind three to nothing, and the Cavaliers seemed unbeatable. But after Francis Pope called a timeout for a pep talk, our Bobcats came roaring back. Get it? The good guys finally managed to tie the score at 19 with two minutes left, then got lucky when a player from Jefferson dropped a pass. Ha! Ah! That's when Randy Bettencourt made one of the most incredible throws in sports history, heaving the disc the length of the field to the speedster Nate Wright, who caught it as time ran out. Speaking of time, Jefferson will have a whole 12 months to lick its wounds. Better luck next year, Cavaliers. The picture is Randy and me hugging. Does this actually say Mupp Bowl? The Weekly Bugle strikes again. It's been five days since the game, and the whole school's still buzzing about it, especially now that the Bugle's just come out. A picture of Nate and Randy hugging, Dee Dee explains. Now that's what I call drama. Ruby flips through the newspaper, wearing a puzzled look. Nate, where's Bugle Blasts? I retired it. I decided I don't want to be a gossip columnist after all. Oh, says Chad as we file into the social studies room. Now there won't be anything fun to read. Oh, yes, there will, I announced, pulling a wad of comics from my notebook. Remember, I'm still the greatest cartoonist at PS38, and this new Mrs. Godzilla adventure is my best ever. I've got a feeling my cartooning career is about to blast off. End.